Hello and welcome to Awful Commentary. Today, I actually I have a special guest, and by special guest, I mean the other person who does stuff on this channel. Hello, Stephen. Hello. I actually made a big mistake right at the beginning. I wanted to like mute my laptop over here to make sure that I didn't get any other <laughs> ambient sounds that would affect the microphone. We can leave this in; it's fine. But then I realised okay. I pressed mute, 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 and then I couldn't hear you because, of course, the headphones are connected to the computer. But anyway, yeah, I'm here after small a, technical difficulties. What a wonderful, fantastic story. Thank I you know, for sharing. right? It's, this is how it works. <laughs> technical Wonderland. It is. What are we talking about today, Dominic? Well, we have both seen X-Men Apocalypse. It was the best As movie has... you've ever seen in your entire life, wasn't it? Well, that, that's not, probably not where we're going to go with this video. Oh. But, you Spoiler know, alert. if that's... Yeah, spoiler alert, that's not where we're going with this video. Uh, firstly, what were your thoughts? What were your expectations for Apocalypse before you saw it? Well, I didn't... I don't think I actually saw many of the trailers. Maybe I saw a bit, but I didn't see much of the promotional material for it. And to be honest, I'm not the biggest X-Men fan in the world. Like, I watched the 90s cartoon, obviously. I mean, who didn't? Um, but, like, I've enjoyed the previous X-Men movies, but I've never been, like, super hyped for an X-Men movie, or, like, I don't know, they've never been my favourite things ever. But I was interested to see Oscar Isaacs be Apocalypse, so I guess that was more of a reason to be excited for the X-Men than, kind of, the rest. But as for the actual movie, it was, yeah, uh, 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 that's the best way to describe it, really. It wasn't Batman I think, that's, versus... I think that's probably fair enough. Yeah. It wasn't Batman versus Superman, but it wasn't Civil War. So meh. So meh, meh indeed. Yeah. What were your thoughts about uh, about Apocalypse as a character before you went in? Like did you know anything about it? Because a lot of like the super fans were looking at the, what Apocalypse looked like in the movie from the trailers and the promotional material and they were like he looks like a Power Rangers villain, um, which really annoyed a lot of people because that's not their preconception of Apocalypse. But as you didn't necessarily have one outside of maybe like the 90s cartoon, like you're saying, like what did you expect him to be like? Or were you just not, did you not have an opinion one way or the other? Um, well, it kind of looked like vaguely how I remembered him to look like, kind of a little bit bigger than most people and different coloured skin and generally menacing. But I mean, I guess he did look a bit like a Power Ranger villain, thinking about it. But, like, I wasn't really... that. He had, like, some tubes coming out near his head or something that I didn't quite... Oh, understand. he had tubes. He had tubes out of the wazoo. Yeah, which I didn't quite understand, but not really knowing why I didn't understand it if that at all makes sense. But yeah, it, it didn't really bother me that much. Like it, well, like you said, I'm no die-hard fan, so like his, uh, his attire or whatever didn't really bother me that much. What did you think of his introduction like? Because the movie opens in Egypt, ancient Egypt, where En Sabah Nur is like, well, I guess the pharaoh, like the god pharaoh of Egypt, and everyone worships him, but some people kind of want to want to off him at the same time. Like, I, I don't know what I was expecting from that opening scene, but I was, uh, maybe underwhelmed. I quite. Enjoyed, I'm not sure what your feelings on it were. I quite enjoyed the the opening section. Um, like I said, I don't know the the uh, ins and outs of the origins of his powers, um, but obviously there was. You could see with all the nodding and the winking and the, the hand movements from the guards and everything that obviously, like, for whatever reason, some people don't like him and they were going to do something nefarious. Um, but, I mean, I guess visually, like, I enjoyed it. It looked cool and everything that was going on. Um, as I said, I don't know how it kind of plays out in accordance to perhaps his his real origins and, like, I didn't necessarily understand, perhaps at the beginning, that those people around him were supposed to be his four horsemen, like the yeah, other the, the people that were protecting him. I didn't quite get at the start that they were the actual horsemen. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed the sequence uh, as it was. Like I, it was fairly easy to see that 
he's reincarnating himself or like transferring from one person to the other to like get their abilities or something to become more powerful and live forever um yeah i i thought it was fairly decent what did you think actually about his powers because they promote apocalypse as being essentially the most powerful mutant that has ever lived and they have a lot of scenes where like professor x is saying things like i've never felt power like this uh, but then when it came down to it, all of his powers seemed to be sand-based. It was, this man is attacking me, so I'm going to turn him to sand. It was, I need to make something, so I'm going to make it from sand. It was like disintegrating walls. But he seemed to have this wide array of powers that were all based around sand. Yeah, like it was, it was menacing, and it was cool when he was in Egypt, because it just seemed to be more that he was just, like, controlling the environment around him. And it was cool when he, like, eats people into the wall. Like, it was impressive. But as, like, a character on the whole, it didn't necessarily strike me as someone that was super mega powerful. Like, he he didn't seem that much more powerful than Magneto. Like, I know Magneto mm. is also a pretty powerful guy but like aside from obviously being able to supercharge everybody else's powers um like he didn't he didn't really do anything like that he as like you said apart from kill some people with sand and give people more powers like the stuff that magneto was doing or like the other people seemed to be more intimidating and like more dangerous than than he was well, this is, yeah, one of my major criticisms with the movie itself was Apocalypse's evil scheme. Um, and the end of the movie, his entire evil scheme is to use Magneto. Like, Apocalypse doesn't do anything. He's like, Magneto, you will pull all of the metal up from the core of the earth and fuck everyone over. And it's like, well, what are you going to do, Apocalypse? Well, all this is going on. And of course, the correct answer should be I'm going to make sure that nobody kills Magneto while he's doing my evil plan. But instead, he's like, I'm going to swap bodies with Professor X because I like his body, I guess. Yeah, oh, I like his powers. He has superpowers that I don't have, so I'm going to swap bodies with him. But why is he doing that in the middle of his evil plan? Yeah, I, yeah, I never really understood. Like, I knew... Magneto was like doing the earth and moving shit but it didn't seem to be it's not the best evil scheme in the world like I was expecting Magneto to do something with all of this metal that he was ripping from the earth like I thought there was going to be an end purpose to it that I don't know it would construct some mega structure or like super uber apocalypse a giant apocalypse or, robot yeah or something um <laughs> or it's like giant sentinel thingy or something but it we just kind of all we got to see was lots of arcs of cgi metal everywhere that kind of didn't mm. do anything it was just there like there didn't seem to actually be any consequence to the earth just like except for um oh jesus bridges being destroyed and the sydney opera house being destroyed like yeah it 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 sounds pretty bad like if you rip all the metal from the earth but then like we've seen buildings and bridges like how many times has a bridge been destroyed and like we've seen buildings collapse countless times for various different reasons like i don't think it really showed the the scale of what the the aftermath of what magneto was doing was actually gonna kind of gonna do or something or did he well the aftermath sorry the, I was just saying, the aftermath of the plan because he did rip quite a considerable amount of the metal back like out maybe afterwards we didn't see it but he reconstructed everything because he's a nice guy but i i don't really see that in magneto's character but the consequences for him seem to be Charles saying, ah, oh, don't worry about it, mate. 
Yeah, I didn't even think about it. Like, what happened to all of that? And I just said he just all flopped back down to the earth again. Like, once well, yeah, he... it would have probably all fallen in on into the water, caused some kind of tsunami <laughs> that wiped out small islands. And then Charles is like, oh, it's just good to have you back. Stay. Stay in the house. Don't worry about it. It's yours. It's yours. No, Charles. No. He's going to prison. Yeah. It's not like in, say, Storm's case, where she was like a confused, lost child. Oh, what does and then she apocalypse do? Apocalypse kind of indoctrinates her. Well, no, yeah, she was... Of the four horsemen, they were all apparently useless, except for Magneto. But they were all recruited to be horsemen because they were the first mutants that Magneto saw. Sorry, the, the Apocalypse saw. So, like, Apocalypse comes, uh, awakens in Egypt, and then he sees a mutant. And he goes, you're a mutant, you're one of my horsemen. Like, granted, it's Storm, and we know how powerful Storm is, but all he saw her do was, like, throw some dust. And he's like, you're on. And then... Why does why does he even go to... Oh, he goes to Caliban and Psylocke because Caliban knows people, it seems. How Apocalypse knows that Caliban knows people, I don't know. But he goes there and he's like, find me some powerful mutants. And then he goes, oh, Psylocke, you're a mutant, you'll do. And then she takes him to Angel and he's like, oh, he he's a cage fighter. He must be one of the most powerful mutants on the planet. And then finally he goes, oh, yeah, that guy is actually incredibly powerful. We should definitely get Magneto on the team. But in the end, his horsemen were just a bunch of people he happened to bump into. And he was like, come on, join the team. So for Apocalypse, we have Apocalypse and his four most conveniently found mutants, as opposed to the best mutants that he could possibly find after scouring the globe for however long he would need to to find the best people. For all of about five minutes, he scours the globe, yeah. I mean, in his time as Apocalypse fighting the X-Men, he comes across way more powerful mutants than the ones he ends up having in his horsemen. He's just, like, kick them out and replace them. Go away, Angel. I don't need you and your kind of metal wings now. I have Wolverine, or... I have, I have, well, I have Jean Grey. I have the Phoenix. What was he doing not getting Jean Grey there? Yeah, you would have thought like when he mind taps in, it's like, now I can see everybody. Thank you. He would have seen someone like Wolverine and been like, all right, he looks a bit better than some of these rogues that I've got flapping around with me at the moment. You... Go and find this guy. Exactly. And then exactly. they go to, like, whatever the creepy Psylocke's buddy friend. He'd be like, they could have gone back and been like, where's Wolverine? Where is he? <laughs> yeah. I want to know. He's like, well, he's feral in the jungle somewhere. But, yeah, he, do he, doesn't, he doesn't even do anything either. Like, he has that kind of cool fight with Professor X in the mansion where he, like, grows all big and, like, they mind fight. Um, but aside from that, as you said, and kill people with sand, Apocalypse doesn't really do anything. Well, this is one of a lot of people's major problems with uh, Apocalypse as a character, as a mutant in this film, is that the ability to grow, shrink, like to change his proportions, is just a power that Apocalypse has. So when he did it in the trailer, people were like, oh good, we're actually going to get a faithful representation of it. And then everyone noticed it was against Professor X, and the Professor X was standing up, and everyone was like, oh, it's just going to it's gonna be like an astral plane fight. Which is cool, like we haven't seen those in the movies yet. But Apocalypse can just get bigger, just normally. And it was kind of a shame that we only saw him use those powers when... Uh, there was a, an excuse for it. There was the excuse for, oh yeah, but it's not literally happening. It's happening in their minds. Um, it would have been nice to get some of like a more physically imposing presence to Apocalypse. So that aside from obviously him having all the screen time, like at least when he stood side by side to the other, or to his horsemen, like he looks bigger. Like he looks like the guy that's going to, destroy worlds or something whereas like he, he just looked like one of the team like maybe a little bit 
bigger because all the tubes, Dom, the tubes. So many tubes, oh my but God. But aside from that, like, he, he wasn't really intimidating physically. I thought Oscar Isaac did, like, a pretty good job uh, as Apocalypse. Like, I wasn't... I was never disappointed by his performance, but mostly because I love Oscar Isaac. But also, like... He's a great actor. Like he's a genuinely good actor, and I think he did a, a good job in that role. But he's like five ten, five eleven. Like he's a normal sized guy, um, who's wearing a bunch of blue makeup, trying to be an intimidating god mutant. And yeah, you know, there's only there's a, like you're saying he's not he's not physically intimidating because Oscar Isaac is like he's not the Rock. He's just a normal guy. And yeah. they didn't play I mean, they, around with him must have been physical force, like they could have done. Yeah, they could have done something, surely, to to try and... Like, he didn't need to be that big in, like, every scene. But, like, obviously, the way that they CGI'd him bigger in, like, the mind fight, like, they surely could have done that for a couple of scenes, like, when they're standing as a group or something, or even just shot it differently so that he at least looked bigger than he actually was like just to make him look more foreboding and like evil and mean like some nice upshots so he looks all nice and scary and big what did you think of uh, the other storylines because this movie was packed full of more storylines than I I even know what to do with so if we try and calm them down if I miss any then please, then please uh, fill, fill in the gaps. Well, I'll so try. we have Go on Apocalypse then. wakes up. Uh, Apocalypse gets buried. He wakes up. He has an evil plan. We have uh, Moira McTaggart, who we first saw in X-Men First Class. She comes back. Um, Which I can't remember. Yeah, well, she was kind of a love interest to Professor X in First Class, but then disappeared and she yeah, she wasn't in the uh, days of future past so she's come back and we have the moira mctaggart professor x uh will they won't they love uh, love storyline then we have magneto and his new family um who are all dead then we have magneto and quicksilver who is his son who isn't dead then we have oh, yeah. mystique is uh the mutant che guevara um but doesn't want to be then we have the continuing mystique beast awkward love triangle we have beast um trying to reform the x-men we have um jean gray and the phoenix force and everybody being like she's a freak she even though she's a mutant we still fucking hate her and then we have cyclops losing his eyes um I was just about to say... Cyclops. And Cyclops losing his brother. At the moment, I'm on ten different plot threads. I'm... I'm yeah, I was like, well, that's about nine or ten as well. But then, like... Um, I'm trying to... Nightcrawler doesn't really have a plot line. Um, Angel doesn't yeah. really. Psylocke doesn't really. Storm, maybe? Maybe, not yeah. not really. I was going to say, maybe. And then they've... I mean, it's not really... You have the... Who is the guy that Psylocke works for? Like, he's in it, but I don't... He doesn't have a storyline as such, but I don't have a clue who he is. Yeah, we, we could just forget about Caliban like, for now. Like, he's it's, a, it's, it's, it's he's too a much to go into. He reminds... Yeah. yeah, he reminds me of, like, in a way of the collector from, like, the Marvel movies, in the sense that he's just a weird guy that's there, and, like, maybe he'll come up again in, like, some other movies or something. Like, when he was first introduced, I had no idea who he was either, like... Oh, it's just some other guy that I don't know anything about. Maybe he'll come back later or something. But, yeah, that's a lot of stuff to try and get into one movie. I can remember I said to you after I saw it that it just seemed to be... They, it just seemed too dis disjointed. Just like a collection of different set pieces happening at the same time that I was happy to watch and I could see things going on, but didn't necessarily slot in nicely together in the film like especially the quicksilver bit mm. like it was like okay we need to have a slow-mo quicksilver montage in there somewhere because maybe everybody liked that from the first movie so we're gonna put that in again but it 
just it just seemed to be there because they wanted it to be there. Yeah, that was a similar feeling to what I had with the Quicksilver bit as well, because it is one of the highlights of the movie. But it's a highlight of the movie because, as you're saying, everybody was like, in Days of Future Past, well, that Quicksilver scene was amazing. So they put in another one because it is visually exciting to see. And, like, there was a lot of humour packed in there. Like, the movie lacked uh, lacked humour quite often. Um, which is fine. It's called X-Men Apocalypse. It should be about the end of the world. <laughs> humour doesn't have to be rampant. But like, they filled in a lot of that, a lot of the humour gaps with Quicksilver like he was essentially there as the funny guy which is not the character of Quicksilver at all like they've completely retconned his character to be something that it's not which is fine you know he's an adaptation of a character and Avengers did the serious version so they can do something a bit different and um and a bit jokey yeah I want to pick up on something that somebody else said on that internet thingy I've heard of it that you you have it's it's pretty great. You can find a lot of things on the internet. Um, why did he get hit by the sonic gun thing? Yeah, this is a very right, interesting why didn't he just point? run away? Yeah. Because in the explosion happens when Havoc destroys the bomb um, that's attached the fusion core that's for some reason attached to the stealth plane, which then destroys all of the mansion. And in the the split second that it takes for Quicksilver, well, for the explosion to erupt out. Quicksilver runs through the mansion, rescues everyone, gets them outside safely, feeds a dog a pizza, and everything's fine. Which means that he is running faster than the speed of light. It's pretty dangerous. Right? Because that eruption should be going... I don't know, I'm I'm not a physicist, so I don't... (laughs) Yeah, it can't be going at the speed of light, but he's got to be running pretty damn close. Um... And yet, when Stryker and his paramilitary force come down and they use their, like, sonic eruptors, the sonic things move at the speed of sound because they're sonic, which is nowhere near, like, it's a decimal point on the speed that he was already running. Like, and yeah. He could have literally moved everybody from the field back into, like... Back into the mansion. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> back into the mansion. He could have rebuilt the mansion and put them back in it before the guy... Like, before they, the helicopters even, like, got to the ground. Why are they still there? I... Or are they like, oh, they're coming to save us? Oh, I guess, yeah. But... I think Like, it... they pull a gun out and Quicksilver should be like... And then, like, the guys get off the helicopter and look at each other and are like... Well, what the fuck just happened? Where have they all gone? Well, again, we know that Quicksilver can move faster than that because in uh, Days of Future Past, there's that bit where um, they fire... They're in the White House and the security guards shoot at them and he yeah, moves he the bullets out of the way. Bullets. And bullets, again, move faster than the speed of sound, which is why you are hit by a bullet before you hear that the gun is fired, right? Idiots. So... I think what we're doing is we're looking at Quicksilver's powers the wrong way. We're looking at it in the traditional, if I'm, we're trying to do this logically, we're looking at it in the traditional comic book sense, in the Avengers sense, in that he is a guy who runs fast. Like, we're looking at him in the same style as the Flash, as a guy who can move his body really quickly, right? But yeah. that's not how we see this Quicksilver use his powers. We see it in the way that he slows down time. Um, so I mm, think we're yeah. looking at Quicksilver and going, God, that guy runs really fast. But I don't think that's the case. I think that he slows down time for for him um, and like a little time bubble that goes around his body. Um, but he has to activate that. Like He doesn't constantly perceive time that slowly because otherwise he couldn't hold a conversation. It would be like talking like this all of the time. And he would just wouldn't be able to hold a conversation with people. So I Yeah, so he was caught unawares so that he wasn't able to like activate his Yeah, he wasn't able to go into like speediness. slow down time mode or whatever, whatever it would be. So I think yeah, it's like a a different variation on his power set because otherwise if he was constantly if the cells and the his atomic structure was constantly moving that quickly, then, yeah, he would be he would be like a wall of sound that he would just go, oh, that's kind of strange. But if he's not 
in his bubble at that time, then everything moves at normal speed until he decides for it to move at a different speed. Goddamn Quicksilver. At least he didn't have a stupid Russian accent. We can both oh, agree on that. that. Yeah, But it kind of also explains why it is that he can't just like snap Apocalypse's neck. Because that's a really cool fight scene between, of them, between the two of them. When Apocalypse yes. is there trying to perceive, trying to target Quicksilver, which was I thought was really interesting. But Quicksilver yeah. hits him and Apocalypse kind of goes flying. But if Quicksilver moves that fast, he could do like a classic flash move, run all the way around the world... With and build up all that speed and then just like take his head off in a single punch. Um, but he doesn't, yeah. he just kind of like runs from one side to another. Um, yeah, he also like his he is like a bit of a comic relief character and he seems like he's just doing it almost for a bit of fun, like oh, I'll knock you this way and oh, I'll knock you back the other way and oh, then I'll knock you back over there as well. But I, I did like the part where like apocalypse is like i don't know learning from him or like reading him to like be able to understand what's going on and like how he's moving so fast and then like then he's able to trap him with the sand and like then he breaks his leg or breaks his knee or whatever which is pretty Classic cool sand move <laughs> sand trap you know what they should have just made him the sand man it should have just been apocalypse i'm oh, sorry x-men the Sandman, and then they get the guy who plays Sandman in Spider-Man 3, and they just put him in there, and then the X-Men are all like, oh, this guy can control sand, and he's in the desert. This is terrible. And then they could have still had a Metallica song in, because they, they could have just, just used the Sandman, Sandman instead. instead. Well, there we go. See, we fixed solved it, all the problems. So what did you think about how, how they set up the next movies? Like, Did you stay for the end credits? Do you see the end credits scene? I actually didn't because I, I know because I was like, well, we've not had like I waited until after like the first credits, and then it started like the full roll of credits, and I was like, nah, ah, oh, screw this, <laughs> I can't be bothered to wait for this. I'll just find out what it was on the internet later. But that's um, fair enough. But it was wasn't it something to do with some guy and some serum and then some evil organization? Oh, it or sure was. I it sure read was. Yeah, an organization that not knowing the ins and outs of everything wouldn't mean anything to me anyway. Yes, that is entirely um, fair. You probably would have got nothing from uh, from the reveal at the end, at the end of the end credits. But what do you think about the way um, they uh, they set up Jean Grey as well for the next one? I don't. I, I don't know. Because they used I her entirely know. as a foreshadowing character in this one. They had her there, and then they were like, Oh, Jean, you're so powerful. Oh, Jean, oh, you're going to destroy the world. And then she defeats the villain single-handedly, um, which is entirely a setup for the next X-Men movie. She, ev- she has to either be the most powerful person in the next movie... Or they'll swing it the other way where she becomes like a recluse because she's like, Oh my god, my I'm my powers are too powerful again, like oh I'm I'm scared of my powers. Like hopefully they go with like she is just awesome, but I don't know, there is a chance that because if she is that powerful, like how do you work that level of power into a movie Without it being like, oh no, we're all gonna die. Oh, Dean Grace here, he's dead. Well, this is what generally what they do with um, with Jean Grey as a character because when the X Men were first made, the original X Men were Cyclops, Jean Grey, Beast, Iceman, and Angel, and it was four guys and one girl, and they were all in love with the girl, and she was weak and constantly had to be saved. Um, Like, Magneto would kidnap Jean Grey, and they'd all be like, no, but I love Jean the most. And then there were some, like, kind of semi-pedophilic scenes with Professor X, when he'd be like, I love Jean, but she's 15 years old, she'll never understand how I feel. And now you look back on it, and you're kind of like, what? Um, But anyway, that's kind of, that's that's all, that's all in the past. But then, as time went on in the X-Men comics, like, by the 1980s, uh, a writer called Chris Claremont took over, and by that point... They'd kind of realised that Jean was massively underrepresented <laughs> in this group. <laughs> and so they introduced the Phoenix Force. Um, 
and all of a sudden Jean went from being the least powerful member of the team who was constantly having to be saved to a goddess of cosmic levels. I was going to say, did they go for that? Oh, she's a bit underrepresented. Let's make her the most powerful person ever. Essentially, yeah, that's exactly what they did. Um, And the way they did that was by introducing the Phoenix. And the Phoenix, they did it... Oh, Jesus. It's really difficult to compare the movies to the comics on this one because in the comics, the Phoenix is um, a being... uh, It's an alien being of cosmic energy. Uh, and it inhabits Jean Grey, and she becomes the Phoenix. Um, and her powers are amplified beyond belief. And then she's corrupted by it, and she becomes the Dark Phoenix. And mm. they've kind of played on this before, where they did it, If you, I don't know if you ever saw X-Men 3, The Last Stand. Oh, we must have been to the cinema to see one... it together. Where Jean Grey like starts melting. And then we're all in the forest or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they're on Alcatraz. And she's and... standing there looking all angry and like. That's the one. Yeah, and they kind of <laughs> and then Wolverine has to kill her at the end because she's going to melt the mm. world if he doesn't. Right, and everyone was really annoyed at that. Yes. Um, but now they've brought the Phoenix back again, and it's not entirely clear what they're doing with it. Are they going to do exactly the same thing again? Because now they've set her up to be this almighty force you're right they can't introduce another villain in it and be like oh but she's more powerful than the phoenix because we know that there's nothing more powerful than the phoenix in this world now right so she has to be the enemy in the next one yeah and then it's like well well, how does she become the enemy i don't know dom i have to wait and find out that's true i don't know I think the uh, but, the end credits the yeah. end credits bit that you you didn't watch um, they go it goes back into the Weapon X facility where Wolverine was when he went all berserker rage and and ran out that was a really cool scene I thought um, like watching Wolverine do that um, but yeah it cuts back into the into the Weapon X facility and someone picks up vials of Wolverine's blood um, and then the case closes and it says like Essex Corp or something like that and. Nathaniel Essex is a character called Mr. Sinister, which is so 80s comic books. I don't even know what to do. He might be early 90s, He's actually. a good guy, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. Just like when you call your son Victor Von Doom or Killgrave. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you're, you're really setting them up for a, for a, a future in heroism, yeah. Um, but yeah, Mr. Sinister, in the comics, again, he's a geneticist from the 19th century who's inspired inspired by Charles Darwin and then Apocalypse makes him immortal um, and then he starts experimenting with mutant DNA and he's like he's a scientist who is constantly trying to experiment with mutation basically um, and there's all kinds of villains that he's created and like, most famously there's one called Madeline Pryor who is like Jean Grey dies after being the Dark Phoenix um and so, so, uh, Mr. Sinister is always convinced that the most powerful mutant of all time would be a child between Jean Grey and Scott Summers, Cyclops. And so he clones Jean Grey, uh, calls her Madeline Pryor, and then makes her go and seduce Scott Summers. And because Scott is all sad because Jean's dead, he's like, you look exactly like Jean, I love you. Uh, and it's really weird. But I have a feeling they're not going to use him in the next X-Men movie. They're going to use him in the next Wolverine movie, which is coming out soon. Because obviously he's now got Wolverine's blood. And so I see. I think they're going to use him as the antagonist for the next and possibly last Wolverine movie to then introduce a replacement for Hugh Jackman. Because they said that Hugh Jackman isn't going to continue as Wolverine. But if they just recast him, people will be like, but Hugh Jackman was Wolverine for the last 20 years. So... Yeah, they need to kind of kill him off somehow. Yeah, I I think what they're going to do is they're going to introduce X-23, who is Wolverine's clone. Uh, And I think they're going to use this... uh, They're going to use Mr. Sinister and this vial of Wolverine's blood to do that. And X-23 is a female clone of Wolverine. Um, She first came in in the X-Men Evolution series I was talking about. She was first introduced in the animated series... And then branched over into the comics. Um, But it would allow them to introduce another female character into it. Um, It would allow them to continue with Wolverine. Because she's essentially the same broody 
character the Wolverine is. She's just like yeah, a teenage with girl. Claws. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. as they're very much favoring these days the um the teenage heroes, I think what we'll see is a teenage version of Wolverine is introduced to go along with teenage Cyclops, to go along with teenage Jean Grey, and then if they want, Hugh Jackman could come in for like one scene as a teacher, and then that'll be about it. Get some more tutoring scenes. I really want to see, in X-Men 2, there's a bit where they go to Iceman's house, and they're like, what exactly did you teach Mr. Logan? And he's like, art. And you're like, Wolverine, you're not an art teacher. But I would love to see a scene with Wolverine as an art teacher. I think that would be so cool. Just painting pictures of, I don't know, frozen forests and Weapon X facilities. And, and things pain. Like that. Pain and memories. Pain. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's just like an old man with long hair. A cranky old man, like, painting with... I don't know, so like blood on a stick or something. His like own blood, Shouting Steve. at his people out the blood. window. His own blood, because it doesn't matter. Just like <laughs> with his own finger. Claw his finger and like painting with his own blood. And then he gets frustrated because his wound keeps healing. So he has to keep cutting himself to finish his artwork. But this is one of, so I'm, one of the things I'm quite worried about if they do introduce X-23. Is that they made her like a depressed emo kid. Um, and there was a lot of scenes of her self-harming. So she'd, like, get her claws out and then, like, cut herself and then she'd heal again. And, like, that's pretty dark. Like, that's dark yeah. for a superhero movie. I'm really hoping that they don't go into that. Um, like, they've, they've got to show that she's troubled because she's a Wolverine character, but, like, yeah. that's too much. It's too much. I think they'll probably avoid... Uh self-harming that doesn't seem like something that they would put in the movie also well, we go. haven't touched on and it would made me think about it because you said moody and emo which makes me think of nightcrawler i didn't like his moody emo hair but i really <laughs> enjoyed nightcrawler in <laughs> in uh in apocalypse yeah he was a bit more fun than the x-men 2 uh interpretation of nightcrawler though everyone quite liked alan coming as as nightcrawler in x-men 2 because it was just great to see him on the screen and I think this night's crawler, this night crawler, didn't have as much of a presence in the movie as the previous one did. But it was just nice to again, nice to have him there, and great to see his power set and how he interacted with the other characters. And yeah, it was almost a shame that we didn't see Colossus. And I know what we saw Colossus like two months ago because he was in Deadpool, but he is kind of one of those new mm. wave of X Men characters, and hopefully we'll get to see him popping up. Uh, again in the next movie. Yeah, well, they, as we've already discussed, and I think we also, we missed out the possible little Wolverine storyline as well. Like they, they had enough storylines going on oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> already yeah. with, without uh, covering anything else. But, yeah, overall, for me, the movie was definitely kind of like, eh, it was it was fun to watch, and like, but... Again, like, I don't know, it didn't, like, blow me out of the park or, like, really turn me on to the X-Men. Like, I've always been, like, lukewarm for X-Men movies and this hasn't really done anything to be, like, all right, yeah, now I'm, like, uh, Team X-Men, like, can't wait for the next one. It kind of just, like, continues the plateau standard for, like, X-Men movies for me. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Again, I think... They have a major problem of having... Because the X-Men have some of the best villains in the Marvel Universe. But the X-Men movies do a really bad job with them. Like, other than Ian McKellen as Magneto. And Fassbender's is good as Magneto as well. Um, but for me, they do... They underrepresent how ridiculously powerful the villains are. Like... Again, I've I've said this to you before, like, Apocalypse comes out wearing a cloak, um, and so nobody can recognise him, and he hides in basements and dungeons and stuff, and you're like, you're Apocalypse! You don't hide in basements shielding your face with a blanket. You should be out there incinerating cities single-handedly. Um, the Four Horsemen are supposed to be there to defend him, 
but essentially you you expend all your energy fighting the four horsemen and then you get to apocalypse and he just like kills you with his pinky game over uh whereas in this he was like skulking and yeah for me like apocalypse doesn't work because he is a god um but they made him little more than a man yeah it w- it would have been nice if they kind of built him up more like even i would been completely fine if they had him also as a villain in the next movie like use this to introduce him and like actually get the horseman to do something so even if it does happen to be like he has just collected the four first people that he comes across at least you could be like oh coincidentally they also happen to be super awesome yeah but like make them look good and like make them do something like you were describing so like it's an absolute chore nightmare like is that like the final boss fight in a video game you get to and you defeat the four horsemen and you're like yes and then another door opens or like there's another bit and you're like oh really seriously Super come boss. on that wasn't the that wasn't the last one and then like then you get there and like i don't know and like apocalypse is like the main goal for the next movie or something like mm. you have this whole movie like defeating his horsemen or something or trying to fight them and then like it sets you up for like oh this ultimate showdown like with apocalypse in the next movie but we won't get that yeah i think the what they the way they mistreated apocalypse is they should have treated him like the alien in alien like the thing that makes the Mm. alien so scary in alien is the fact that you never see it you don't yeah, see you it. You know yeah. that it's unbelievably powerful, but you don't know what it can do. You don't really know what it looks like. You see it from shadow, and then when it strikes, it decimates. And for me, that's kind of what they should have done with Apocalypse until the end of the movie. Like, the four horsemen are the face of... If you're going to keep him in shadow, then use it. Um, so that when he is revealed, like, it's hell on earth. Um... I also feel like they should have used Apocalypse's main scheme to be unleashing the Phoenix. And Mm. I think they misused that Phoenix force by just going, Gene, use your power. What they should have done is have Gene repressing it, Professor X trying to keep it safe, trying to keep it locked in, uh, and then having Apocalypse, yeah, let it out. Yeah, and it makes him look a little bit smarter as well. Like, he's just manipulated this whole scenario not to take over the world or rip the metal from the ground or not to get Professor X's sexy new body. It's because he wanted them to feel like they were in the most dire situation where everything was going to collapse and fall, so they have to force... Gene Grey to unleash everything and then he's like ha 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 now I can I don't know I can take the phoenix force or something yeah he really should have put himself in Gene Grey's body like why did he want to go into Professor X's body when Gene is waiting he can't even walk (laughs) yeah I thought that as well but I guess he does have like the healing powers so maybe that would heal his legs but his spine it's not like there's anything wrong with his legs it's his spine um (laughs) But yeah, I don't I don't know. I guess it would have healed it unless it would have done like a Deadpool and crippled all of his body. Oh, maybe. There you go. That's his one weakness. What? He's an idiot. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's the one. Fundly meant went after the wrong person. Well, I think we've talked that's about it, this. Dominic. I think we've talked about this uh, enough now. I think there might be a fair bit that you can edit out if you don't just want to upload it all in. in no. One track. It's all gold. Well, it's like 40 minutes. <laughs> Shut up. Gold. 40 or minutes of gold. F- like like Apocalypse's pyramid top. All and where did he gold. even get that from? One of the major things with Apocalypse <laughs> is that he's not just the first mutant, well, kind of the first mutant, but... The, a lot of his 
abilities and technology come from aliens, which again, you know, they've messed this universe up because apocalypse he is made powerful from sand, aliens, Dom. but they don't want to use aliens in the movie. Jean Grey's Phoenix Force comes from aliens, but they don't want to use aliens in this movie. Scott Summers and Alex Summers, the Havoc and Cyclops, their parents were abducted by aliens, but they don't want to use aliens in these movies, right? So they've got these three separate things that are all interwoven about space, and they've said that the next one maybe will be space-based, which they they might do for, um, like, to explore Phoenix a bit more, maybe. But they've all taken elements from the, uh, the storyline, but they're like, oh, no, that's too crazy. Like, they've taken the strongest villain and then gone, but we can't use all of him because that's too crazy. Then they've taken the Phoenix, called Phoenix Force and gone, oh, that's a great storyline, but we can't use all of it because it's too crazy. And then they've taken the Summers Brothers any... and gone, oh, well, we can't use all of it because it's too crazy. There is a third Summers Brother called Vulcan who is, in the comics, becomes the emperor of an alien empire. <laughs> But they won't do that because it's too scared. crazy, you know? And it's like either they should fully invest themselves in the storylines and the characters and the abilities that they're going for or just don't use them at all. Like every time they go halfway, they fall flat because that's not how the characters were originally envisioned. And they're trying to fill in the blanks when they've taken the pieces away. It's like you have a jigsaw puzzle, you remove the, the pic- some of the bits because you're like, oh no, I don't like those ones. And then you try and put in your own pieces, but that's not the original puzzle. Apocalypse can just make some new pieces from sand. You, but it would be a sandy fucking puzzle, I can tell you that. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's our thoughts sandy pu- on Apocalypse anyway. <laughs> so, yes. did you guys see the movie? What did you think about it? I mean, judging by how the box office figures have been, not that many people have seen it. More people saw Batman vs Superman, but this, I, it was better than Batman vs Superman. But it was better than Batman vs Superman. It was, was Deadpool no... also this year. Yes, Deadpool was this year. Deadpool was the highest yeah. grossing X Men movie of all time, and this one yeah. stands no chance of getting anywhere near it. Because it was nowhere near as good as Deadpool. It was nowhere near as good, and it was essentially twice as long. <laughs> yeah. And had half as many characters, and <laughs> probably half the budget. Um, anyway. Well, his... So yeah, it's somewhere somewhere between... Well, I don't know. It's just floating just above. I'm trying to think of, like, the scale of movies this year. Like, Civil War and Deadpool, then uh, Apocalypse, then Batman vs. Superman at the bottom. I think that's fair. Well, this is, Unless, I think... Unless, I mean, uh, they are... Yeah, I was say, this is a, a, a question for, for the listeners, really. Would you be interested, after seeing X-Men Apocalypse... Would you be interested in seeing Apocalypse make a return in, say, the X-Force movie? Because uh, we discussed this before about how X-Force is like the X-Men's Black Ops team, um, which features Wolverine and Archangel, who was introduced in this one, and Psylocke, who was introduced in this one, and Deadpool, and then another character called Phantom X. And one of the missions that they do is assassinating a reincarnated Apocalypse. He's reincarnated into the body of a child, and then this Black Ops murder team has to kill him before he could become Apocalypse again and destroy the planet. Um, I can remember you telling me about that. Yeah. Would would you be interested in seeing that? I'd be more interested in that than probably whatever they're going to do next. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you guys think? Leave a comment below and and let us know yeah if you think would would that be an interesting turn for the x-force movie to do because olivia munn who played psylocke said i want to be in an x-force movie with deadpool and ryan reynolds as we know is pretty much up for anything because deadpool is his <laughs> career now god damn it let him be in everything let him be in everything why not well you never know because the x-men movies are now performing not as well as the deadpool movie did <laughs> perhaps he will now be the uh, the stanley of X Men films, <laughs> that would be amazing. Which I thought actually, Stanley's cameo in this was one of the better Stanley cameos that I've seen. 
Uh, I can't even I can't even remember what it was. Yeah, there were, the nuclear missiles were flying into the sky, and Stanley is there holding oh, his wife, watching the missiles. Stanley is. He's all like, "Oh no." That was right. Yes, yes. He's not delivering pizza or something this time. Yeah, they said they said for Civil War they were like, "Oh, Stanley delivered some pizza. We put some real thought into that cameo." And I was like. Really? <laughs> oh, he wasn't. He was delivering um, the parcel, wasn't it? And the parcel, the parcel had, like, yeah, the Tony letter. Stank. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, was that really like you put some effort into that? Um, <laughs> but yes, that those are our thoughts on X Men Apocalypse and also Stan Lee's uh, cameos in, in <laughs> cameos. The recent movies, um, and also Deadpool, and <laughs> yeah, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So thank you for listening to us today on Awful Commentary. And we hope to see you again soon.